Hello, everyone, and welcome to this new edition of Your Question, the bi monthly webinar of the Jacques Delors Institute. Today, we have the pleasure to welcome Pierre Arroche, lecturer at the, in international security at the Queen Mary University of London. After a year of war in Ukraine, several calls were made at European level to arm the Ukrainian war effort by tanks, planes, guns, or drones. However, this war was revealed that the European defense industry was sized for decades to produce the minimum necessary in peacetime. How can we contribute to help Ukraine under this situation? What roof for maneuver does the EU have in relation to its member states or NATO? Is Europe up to the task by providing military assistance as the US or the UK. Before handing the floor to our guest speakers, I would like to remind you that the Q&A tools is available at the bottom of your screen. Mr. Arroche, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much for, for having me, Lara. Um, first, I would like to, to remind a few major points. First, that we have a high intensity war going on in Ukraine and it has uh, strong implications for, for Europeans because a high intensity war is also an industrial war. Um, it, it doesn't mean just that the, 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 the scale of the, uh, of the combat is of an industrial nature. It also means that you win this war because of your industrial capacity. It means that you cannot win such a war just with the capabilities that you had on day one. You win such a war with the, the capabilities that you are able to produce during the course of the war. And that's why it is at its core an industrial, an industrial war. Of course, Russia is doing its best in terms of mobilization or import from friendly countries such as Iran to, to strengthen its capabilities. And Ukraine relies a lot on the support of Western partners. But it also means that we have to uh, strengthen our industrial capabilities. And we Europeans, and I will argue that this is a task that we will have uh, to do uh, even more in the future, we Europeans have to uh, switch to a wartime uh, economy mode. And what does it mean in practice? Uh, this question was uh, raised very recently also by um, Kaya Kalas, um, Prime Minister of Estonia, uh, at the end of the latest uh, European Council, when she said that we were not uh, ready, uh, that we had to, to produce more and, and, and faster in terms of weapons that we could eventually deliver to Ukraine. And so the first question is, how do we do that? How do we switch to a wartime uh, production uh, scale? Uh, and the the only way to do that, you, of course, you can you can meet uh, representatives of the of the defense industry and ask them to do a lot of things. But the only actual argument that will convince them to invest to invest, sorry, uh, to build uh, new lines of production is the assurance that it will pay off, that they will receive regular orders in the future that uh, will make their investment pay off. So what we need here is a genuine European industrial policy that can uh, send a credible signal to the defense industry that it is rational to invest, to invest in, uh, in, in, a, in, in a stronger production and faster production. And this objective, um, that uh, seeks to, to, to strengthen our support for Ukraine also interacts with a related question, which is the rearmament, not just of Ukraine, but of member states. And this uh, particular question was also raised uh, immediately after the outbreak of the war. Um, and it was um, developed by uh, the European Council in March 2022 uh, in the so-called uh, Versailles agenda that was adopted uh, in Versailles during the, the, the summit. And this Versailles agenda basically says that um, if European member states rearm, which they are trying to do at the moment, they should do it in a rational way. That is, in a way that is 
concerted um, and also in a way that is cooperative. So they should consult one another in terms of the priorities in which they invest. And also they should try to uh, make uh, joint procurement to buy together uh, the same military equipment because it generates eco economies of scale, but also even more important because it facilitates cooperation among European armies, uh, the so-called interoperability uh, issue. And there is an additional uh, issue that we have uh, identified during uh, the, the, the war in Ukraine, which is that it's also easier to deliver weapons uh, for Europeans when they all have the same models uh, and it's much more difficult when each uh, member state has its own equipment and is unable to reach a critical mass uh, that it can send to Ukraine. So this Versailles agenda led Europeans to ask the Commission to propose instruments and this are we have debates at the moment in Brussels on how to support even financially with fundings from the European Union budget, um, joint acquisition of military equipment by member states. But actually I would argue that these two questions, um, the, re, uh, the military support for Ukraine and member states rearmament are just two sides of the same coin because eventually when member states uh, send weapons to Ukraine, it empty their stocks. So they have to rearm themselves and so on. So actually, uh, Ukraine should be uh, seen as virtually yet another member states in terms of uh, um, the EU industrial policy, defense industrial policy. And do we have the required instruments to do that? The answer is no. And that's why we still have debates on how can we, how can we do that? Uh, that's why Kaya Kalas raised uh, this issue, saying that uh, we could we we still didn't have the required instruments to um, to to have a proper de a European uh, uh, defense industry policy. Because what we have, what we do have, are a, a series of ad hoc or limited instruments. We have the European Peace Facility, which is primarily uh, an external action. Uh, instrument that doesn't, uh, which is not really designed to to conduct an ambitious industrial policy. It was designed to support, in a limited way, partner partners, countries, armies. Generally, it was assumed that it could be in the in the in the context of a a, a training mission, uh, a European training mission in the country, or something like that. It was not designed to support a high intensity war in which the European Union industry had to switch to a wartime a production mode. We also have limited industrial instruments, the European Defence Fund supporting research and development. Now we have these discussions about EDIRPA and, and EIDP, which are instruments seeking to strengthen um, European defense industry, but they are industrial um, instruments in the sense that they are based legally on uh, industrial objectives. And they are not uh, actually defense instruments that can be used as a way to strengthen the capabilities of the European Union and its, and, and its member states. So my key conclusion here is that eventually uh, beyond these um, short-term or ad hoc limited instruments, we will have to have a proper debate on a potential European defense budget. And that's the way forward, I would argue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arsch, uh, for your enlightening presentation. So I've really said it's a particular sensitive subject. Um, I would also just like to tell your audience that your last publication is available on the Jacques Delors Institute website. It's on the guarantee for Ukraine. It's only available now in French, but soon in English. Uh, so we received a few questions. Um, Maybe a first one, um, how can the member state give more to Ukraine if their own stock are already empty or close to be empty? Well, um, first of all, 
there is the question of how do you assess that stocks are empty? This is not a this is not a ridiculous question in the sense that um, I think you have to to have a clear view of the priorities. Sometimes you had you have debates on whether or not you can send some military equipment because you might need them at the national level in Western Europe, for instance. Um, if you think about uh, uh, um, tanks, for instance, uh, there were many debates in Western European countries about how um, the fact that they could be needed nationally so that the sending too much uh, battle tanks to Ukraine could be risky. Here, my answer would be that um, by far, the priority is Ukraine. And everything that you send to Ukraine is part of your security guarantee as a European state. It's not a loss for our national defense. It's quite the opposite. Uh, I, I, I developed the, 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 the analogy of the fire extinguisher. If there is a, a fire in your neighbor's kitchen, it would be ridiculous to refuse to 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 to, to give your fire extinguisher because, and, and wait uh, that uh, fire reaches your own apartment, for instance. And that's the same in the case of Ukraine. So it's not a loss when you send weapons to Ukraine. It's about building a protection for yourself. But nevertheless, it's true that we have limited stocks. And that's why um, the question of production is key. We, as I said earlier, you cannot Ukraine cannot rely on its day uh, its day one uh, stocks, and we cannot rely on on our day uh, day one stocks. So that's why we have to relaunch uh, production. We have to start uh, thinking about not just rearmament about with the 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 production capacity that we have, but we have to strengthen our production capacity, and there is no there there's no way to circumvent um, this issue. I thank you. Maybe a second question: What are the type of military equip equipment Ukraine needs now, and that the EU member state have in stock and have not yet provided to Ukraine? Well. Um, Ukrainians would be best place to talk about their military needs, but uh, um, I think I would insist on one particular uh, uh, category of equipment that Ukrainians have, uh, have demanded a lot. Uh, any equipment that can increase uh, the, the range of their artillery strikes. Why? Um, this is an important point because when we talk about long range, long range capabilities for Ukraine, some people are reluctant because they think that it, it can be offensive. Uh, it could be dangerous to send long range uh, military equipment to Ukraine, uh, allowing them to strike Russia, for instance. And I would argue the opposite. When you give long range weapons to Ukraine, you allow Ukrainians to destroy logistical uh, depots and, 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 and deposits um, in the, the, the Ukrainian territory so that Russians are no longer able to rely on a strong logistical base so that they're no longer able to conduct offensive. So actually, the main obstacle for Russian offensives uh, at the moment is really this, this logistical problem that um, they have to, uh, to, 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 to push their logistical base far away from the front because they know that if it's too close from the front, it can be, uh, it, it is uh, within the range of uh, the Ukrainian artillery. So if you increase the range of uh, the Ukrainian capability to strike uh, Russian targets, you also deprive Russians of the ability to conduct uh, effective combined operation uh, attacking Ukraine. So that's a key, uh, I think, a key category. A follow-up question for that. So you've mentioned in your presentation that uh, the EU industry, military industry needed to be common, but do, if they send it to Ukraine, doesn't the time required for Ukrainian army and soldier to adapt weaken them temporarily? 
Uh, you, mean, you mean it would be difficult for them yeah, to... To, to adapt because the uh, industry now is completely different and in the future they may be common? Um, yeah, I think there is a long term objective here. Uh, you can have short term objective like sending what we have today to Ukraine, but you can also think in terms of the longer term. And I think it is particularly true for the European Union because the European Union has accepted to consider Ukraine as a candidate country. So we have this prospect that one day Ukraine will become a member state. So investing in the longer term convergence between Ukraine and the European Union in the integration of the Ukrainian uh, defense industrial base uh, within a, a European-wide defense industrial base is a, 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 rag, a, a rational objective for our defense policy. So there are different uh, uh, time uh, time perspectives, but I think they they should be they, they we we should have them in mind uh, uh, because um, strengthening uh, Ukraine's capabilities is also a longer-term objective. Well, thank, thank you. Another question. What are the main false narratives circulating in Europe that provide argument not to arming Ukraine? Um, well, I mentioned one already. That is the idea that what you send in Ukraine is a loss for you. So it's, it, it decreases uh, you, the level of your own security. I think it's completely wrong and that's quite the opposite. Um, there is also another narrative very common that if you uh, strengthen Ukraine, you, uh, you, you, you push escalation. And so that's uh, the, the, the war uh, extends and becomes more risky and more dangerous. Again, I would say that's it, the opposite. Why? Because um, a key factor favorable to escalation and dangerous misunderstandings between adversaries is ambiguity. If Russians um, have reasons to expect that Europeans and more generally Western support for Ukraine will eventually collapse, that's for them uh, an incentive to push further, to be more aggressive in the hope that eventually we will stop our support for Ukraine and we will let Russia prevail. But if Russia is convinced that Western support to Ukraine is rock solid, is credible in the long term, they will have to deal with that. And so I would, and in this case, it might encourage them to be more prudent um, and to be more conservative. So I would argue that actually, being consistent in our support to Ukraine and putting our acts in 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 in, 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 in uh, where where our words are is the way to avoid misunderstandings and eventually uh, an intended escalation. Thank you. Coming back to the uh, uh, military industry, is it national rather than collaborative cross border production quicker and cheaper? Um. Quicker, certainly, yes, in the sense that it's always more complex and difficult to conduct uh, cooperation as opposed to just conducting a, um, a national uh, project. Cheaper, certainly not, because eventually, um, if, you, if you conduct a you, um, national project, you uh, you, will, you, you cannot benefit from a lot of economies of scales that you can benefit from uh, when you combine several, uh, several countries. And that's the problem. If you look at um, the debate we had um, in, in the last few months, again, thinking about battle tanks. So in France, the Leclerc battle tanks, a great battle tank uh, from a technological point of view, but a battle tank that essentially in Europe was only sold in France. And that contributed not just to the fact that it was uh, more expensive, but also to the fact that it is now much more difficult to use it because we have less 
uh, uh, units, we have less spare parts, and it's much more difficult to cooperate with our partners with this kind of weapon that is not shared among uh, several countries. So joint projects are cheaper, at least in the, in the medium, longer term, and more effective on the ground. Thank you. And uh, maybe coming back to your publication, uh, do you think that the EU is or will be able to bring security guarantee to Ukraine um, in the same way NATO is doing it for its own members? Well, um, the, the, the argument I tried to, to, to make in the paper is that if some EU member states are already ready and willing to uh, offer security guarantees to Ukraine uh, individually. This is the case, for instance, uh, for France. Uh, I think recently the French president uh, again talked about that uh, with the US president. So first, a, a few EU member states are already willing to do that, to provide security guarantees to Ukraine. Second, um, in a few years, 10, 15 years, perhaps, I don't know, Ukraine will become a European Union member state and will benefit from Article 42.7 that constitute uh, a security guarantee against an armed aggression. So the effort to in between is not so, so big in the sense that providing security, European Union-wide security guarantees now instead of partial or security guarantees just by some Europeans now and by the European Union later, it's not so big. And I would say that it is a, a, a very important interest for the European Union because it's a question of cohesion instead of having one part of the European Union that, uh, that, that, can, that has to go to war to defend Ukraine and one part of the European Union that doesn't have such a commitment which would considerably damage the coherence and unity of the European Union external policy, we could act as a bloc. And second, it's also logical for the European Union to support uh, a candidate country uh, because we have many programs that, uh, seeks to, that seek to facilitate uh, the convergence between candidate countries and the European Union in terms of the economy, legal requirements, and here it would just be the equivalent in terms of security, because of course, a candidate country will not be able to join uh, the, the European Union safely if it is vulnerable to external attacks. So I would say that it is doable and it is very important. And final argument, the European Union is also willing to invest more in its geopolitical role more generally. And uh, uh, having this role as a security guarantor, among others, the European Union would certainly not be the only one. Uh, the United States, the United Kingdom, at least, will also be uh, security guarantors, would be key in this emergence of the European Union as an important and a credible geopolitical actor in the world. I thank you. We received two different questions from the same person. Um, the three pillars planned for the European Union jointly proposed by the Commission, the European Defence Agency and the European uh, External Services will be enough according to you. Uh, Thierry Breton said that he will visit the European defence industry in order to convince them to increase their production. Do you think that it will be um, any effect or must he also bring money uh, for this? Um, as I said, these are short-term uh, solutions uh, for a short-term objective, which is to be able to provide very quickly um, ammunition to Ukraine. But these are not uh, credible and effective longer-term solutions. Uh, what is the triple solution that is on the table uh, today in Brussels? First, it's a combination of existing instruments. First, the European peace facility, but I've already said that financially it is not well equipped to invest in defense. We have to, to remind ourselves also that the peace facility is just a system of um, uh, 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 producing checks. There is no 
budget. There, there, there are no funds that are directly available. It's just a system through which member states um, uh, uh, are agreed together to reimburse one another when uh, they, they, they commit to send weapons to Ukraine. So that would be the first pillar. The second pillar would be ad hoc coalitions of the willing among member states willing to invest jointly to, support, to, to buy ammunition to Ukraine. So it's great in the short term, but it's not a long-term solution to conduct a credible industrial policy. And finally, there's discussion with the industry. And it's great that uh, the European Commission and Commissioner Breton are willing to do that. But as the, the question uh, suggests, um, it will not be effective if there is no, if 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 there is not a, a strong financial uh, commitment. You can tell um, uh, in, in defense companies that they should produce more, or that they, they should reorganize uh, their production. You will only be credible if you can send a big check and provide assurance that there will be orders. That's what the European Commission did. Uh, with the pharmaceutical industry uh, when it wanted to secure um, joint procurement of COVID vaccines. And it worked because the European Commission was able to say, I do represent a market, for, uh, the, the, the whole European Union market. So if you want to have, to, to have access to the European Union market in terms of vaccine procurement, you have to talk with the European Commission. This is not where we are at the moment in the defense industry, but that could be the objective. Thank you. And, and a more NATO-related question. Could the European arms industry compete effectively with the US arms industry? Um, well, today the problem is that um, the incentive to for Europeans to just buy in the shelves, not just from uh, the U.S. industry, but also from other non-EU industry. If you think about Poland buying uh, military equipment from South Korea, for instance, this incentive is too strong because member states focus on the short term and it is understandable. They want to have equipment readily available quickly. But in doing that, they also overlook the longer the, the lo longer term objective which is to strengthen our own european industrial base the objective is not necessarily to have the equivalent of the us industrial base it's just to have a stronger and more coherent in a defense industrial base that is able to support a genuine rearmament uh, program from europeans it's not to to, to, to be stronger than, uh, to, to be the number one in the world. It's just to have something coherent with our own defense objectives and not to have, um, to be too dependent on external supply. Thank you. And the last question, what do you think of the position of Switzerland that have a, a military industry but does not allow the, uh, the EU country to, to give their materials to Ukraine? Well, <laughs> Uh, that's that's their choice, and we know that uh, they are a neutral country. But it also means that um, we cannot just assume that relying on non-EU country is okay. And Switzerland is just one example with this with with uh, its neutral policy. But uh, you can have uh, similar problems with other countries. It's not just okay to rely on, on non-European countries. And a key argument that we have to have in mind is that if you want to have security of supply, if you want to be sure that you will have the military equipment you need in times of crisis, you have to have some European capabilities within the European Union that you control. Because if you depend on non-EU country, there's not much that you can do.
Thank you very much, Mr. Harosh, for pleasure. all uh, this explanation. Um, and thank you to you for following today's Zoom question. You will soon receive the replay available on YouTube. The next session will be held on Wednesday, 29th March. We will have the pleasure to welcome Andreas Aizo, a researcher at the Jacques Delors Institute in the Economy Policy. He will come back to us on the reform on the Stability and Growth Pact. Thank you again for your participation and have a nice afternoon. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Harosh.